Sierra Sangway, Ferrari's first four-door. But I have no intention of being a backseat driver today. This is the Val d'Aone and the Lago di Malgo Boazzo, caught mid-north between spring at its base and winter up high. The road has the colour palette of an ice cream cone when viewed from afar, but with its frozen waterfalls and crystal clear air, it is simply stunning. As soon as I knew we were coming up towards the Dolomites, I started looking for roads and I wanted something that wasn't just all hairpins like the Stelvio. I love these tunnels. They're just fantastic. What a piece of road. I've been trying to think how to approach this review because there's an awful lot to say about the Pura Sangue. We could start with the practicalities perhaps, because this obviously is the most practical Ferrari to date. We could say things like the fact that this is only available as a full four-seater, and you do get fantastic looking bucket seats in the back that are every bit as good as these ones up front. There's precisely 473 litres of luggage space if you're interested in the numbers, but the rear seats do fold down if you want to try and fit a bike in or something. In terms of the cockpit, it follows the general theme introduced in the Roma and SF90. There have been little changes, but I still didn't find it the most responsive and user-friendly in terms of the haptic switches. What is new is the rotary control on the dash for the climate control and seats. It's a bit of theatre, and actually it's easier to use than I thought it might be. Those electric rear doors, being electric seems a little bit odd to me, but they do make ingress and egress a bit easier. And again, they're a bit of theatre for this first four-door Ferrari. Then there's the Burmester stereo with 21 speakers and ribbon tweeters, and it does sound fantastic, absolutely brilliant. All in all, if you want to use your £300,000 per Sangway for the school run at the end of an Exiat, or take it on a medium-sized shopping spree at Fortnum's with friends, then it's got you covered. But what I really wanted to know about this was, well, does it live up to its name? Puro Sangway, thoroughbred. More importantly, is it a car that I would have been excited about age 13? Yes, that's me, a small Ferrari fanatic, a teenage tifoso. And what I would have cared about, what I still care about, is whether this car, for all its extra doors and greater ground clearance, is still a proper Ferrari at its core. Have they just produced something that people can drive around and has the badge on, but isn't really a driver's car? That's what I want to find out. The first thing says that this definitely has an engine worthy of a Ferrari. That naturally aspirated V12, I can't believe they put it in this car really, but it's quite a statement of intent. And they said that this is the only engine that the Puro Sangue will have. It's not gonna get a V8, it is a V12 car. And what a V12. Six and a half litres, 65 degrees between the banks, 725 horsepower. But there are two really important things that I was hoping would have been improved and have been, are the torque and the sound. 
You see, in the GTC4 Lusso, I always thought that it was just a bit too torque light. In this, Ferrari has really worked to improve the torque of the engine. So it has 528 pounds foot of torque, and 80% of that, so about 420 pounds foot, is available from just 2,100 RPM. And it just makes the whole car feel more muscular. The Pura Sangway's engine is designated as the F140 IA, and its specific torque curve was achieved by completely redesigning the intake manifold and the plenums. The entire exhaust system with its equal length headers was also changed to match the work done on the intake side. Elsewhere, special attention was paid to the lubrication of the engine, with particular focus on new piston rings and the semi bearings. Then there's the sound. And yes, I get it, it's meant to be more practical, more every day, it should be able to mooch around relatively quietly. But I always felt the GTC4 Lusso was just a bit too demure, you didn't really know you'd got that big V12 up the front the whole time. With this, there's no doubting it at all. <laughs> what an engine! It is ferocious! and it's matched to this new 8-speed DCT box. Same ratios as in the 296 GTB apparently. So nice short ratios down low to help the acceleration. 3.3 to 62, this will do. <laughs> as ever, it's a brilliant Ferrari transmission. Being a DCT, not an auto, towing, it's out with this car. You have to get something else, get an estate or something, if you want to carry an awful lot of luggage and tow a horse box. This is all about the horses under the bonnet. That then is a big emotional box ticked. The heart of the car is very much Ferrari and your ears will not feel shortchanged. But what about your eyes? The look of the Puro Sangue well, it definitely gets attention because it's just very striking and it's, it's very muscular, it's big, definitely, but then you see it from outside and sometimes it looks smaller and it's got a lot of aero detail going on as well from those sort of eye sockets, a bit like the 720S around the daytime running lights and then that sort of big, wide, almost sort of grin splitting it across the front as well. Go down the side and you've got those floating wheel arches which Ferrari has actually patented and it just give it a, a really curious, intriguing look. At the back, well, you've got no rear wiper because of the way they've put that sort of convex screen in there, a bit like a Citroen CX for anyone that remembers one of those. Overall, it's not elegant, but it is a head turner, and Ferrari has clearly managed to incorporate the easier access, higher driving position, and some of the increased ground clearance of a slightly loftier vehicle without going the whole SUV hog. Now, earlier on, I didn't perhaps tell the entire truth, or perhaps I wasn't specific enough because I said that this was Ferrari's first four-door Ferrari, and I should have said it's their first production four-door because there was this, which is the Ferrari Pinin. It was Pininfarina's 50th birthday present to itself, and it had the blessing of none other than Enzo Ferrari himself. It's a curious looking thing, I think you'll agree. It does sort of foreshadow this a bit, particularly with the interior, I think, and all the, the digital screens front and rear that that has, and obviously this has as well. Never came to production. Perhaps, perhaps the looks were a bit too challenging for people. Also, I think there was a worry about build quality and sort of going up against other luxury manufacturers. You could perhaps get away with sort of more when you're just producing fast sports cars. But one of these show cars did get bored and then it got bought again, and eventually somebody decided, well, we'll put some running gear in this. So they took the running gear, I think, out of a full one, two, and popped it underneath. Now, there's a nice little end to this as well, because the company that did the fitment of all that running gear was none other than a little outfit just outside the front gates of Ferrari itself, called Marinello Perosangue. It's somehow nice to know that Enzo Ferrari gave his blessing to a four-door even if it never reached production. Anyway, let's put the history books away and pick up the engineering manuals again, with reference to this car's handling. 
It weighs a chunky 2033 kilos dry, but the chassis is 4% lighter than that of the smaller GTC4 Lusso, while also being 30% stiffer torsionally and 25% stiffer in flex. Meanwhile, the clever four-wheel drive system first seen on the FF is retained, taking drive off the front of the crank and passing it through a two-speed gearbox to the front wheels when required. The car is fundamentally rear-wheel drive until it needs to send power to those front wheels and it does feel definitely really rear biased. The steering's not quite as sharp as other Ferraris, but actually again, I think that works well. We've also got the individual rear wheel steer, which was first seen on the 812 Competizione. But the really big news with this is the active dampers. They use technology called True Active Spool Valve, which was developed by Multimatic. Each damper has a liquid-cooled 48-volt brushless motor attached to a recirculating ball screw. This can then either slow down or actually accelerate the damper stem, depending on what the control module, neatly wrapped around the lower part of the damper, tells it to do. There are still traditional hydraulic damper valves, both as backup and because apparently it adds some smoothness to the overall operation. Why go to all this trouble? Well, in addition to negating the need for traditional anti-roll bars, the claim is that it gives more precise control of vertical, roll and pitch movements. It means there should be better wheel control over rough surfaces while also maintaining body control. To this extent, there are now up to three options for the ride, independent of the handling mode you're in. There are five stages on the Manatino. There's ice, wet, comfort, sport and then ESC off. As soon as you turn into sport, you feel that edge arrive, that edge that you would recognise if you'd driven a more, well, outwardly sporting Ferrari. And the wheelbase seems to just shrink. And you start to chuck this car around in a way that you wouldn't think possible. It is incredibly agile, this car. You can still feel the weight at times, and actually I think it's almost better just to slacken the dampers off one notch maybe, back down to their medium setting. It just makes the car feel slightly happier. I definitely don't think you need to go all the way to soft. But it just gives it a slightly nicer flow, perhaps works better with these winter tyres. The seasonal rubber obviously limited outright performance, but also meant the balance was easier to explore, and it does feel very playful. Things I'm not quite sure about with those dampers, well, just under braking, because it keeps it so flat, it, it reduces that pitch. And at times I felt the pedal can just feel a bit, a little bit numb perhaps. There's nothing wrong with the stopping power, but it's just a slightly disconcerting feeling. And while the body control is impressive, the ride was marginally less so. I just didn't feel that in more relaxed driving, the Pura Sangui delivered quite the costing comfort I was perhaps expecting. It's certainly no Range Rover or Rolls riding on air. However, if I had to choose with a Ferrari, I would prefer it that way around. Precision before poshness. It really is so fun. On a road like this, which is, I thought, might be a little bit narrow for it. But actually, you really can enjoy it in the Pura Sangue. I'd be lying if I said I got to the end of my day with Ferrari's first four-door production car and completely understood what or why. I do, however, get why they've said it's not an SUV like a Bentayga or DBX. It doesn't look or feel like it's come from that sort of mould, and while it has hill descent, I wouldn't want to take it off-road. Is it practical? Sort of but it's not a load lugger like an RS6 either. And then there's the one. The curious thing is that Ferrari isn't doing this for mass production. It's not trying to get masses more sales. They'll only ever produce enough of these to cater for 20% of its overall production. So it doesn't seem to be a sales booster or money spinner like the Porsche Cayenne or Lamborghini Urus. Perhaps I'm missing something. But what really matters to me is that it's not diluting the brand, mostly because of that magnificent V12 engine under the bonnet. 
And that means if you find yourself on a road like this, it won't disappoint. If I was 10 years old, sitting in one of those back seats, and this was my first experience of a Ferrari, I'd definitely be impressed. I would think it lived up to the legend. This is definitely a Ferrari. Thank <laughs> you.